So, hello everyone, and thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Rick DeVore. I run a small Drupal shop here in Melbourne, which I uh, do with a passion and for a living. But in my spare time, I like to tinker with maps. This is a site building session, so there will be no coding, but there will be no laborious button pushing either. I want you to leave this room thinking, feeling inspired and thinking, I can do this. I'm going to go home and I'm going to build some of those beautiful maps and make my site a better place to visit. So to entice you, I will show you a number of uh, beautiful examples of uh, map candy from across the world done in Drupal with the modules that you learn about in this session. So to me, maps are, first of all, beautiful things. Maps are strong visual elements that can really make your site shine. They draw attention. But also, they make great navigational tools. <clears throat> they form alternatives to the uh, drop-down menus, where, whereby you have to laboriously go through and find what you want, or a search box. We'll see an example of that in the next slide. And thirdly, maps are great analytical tools. Maps help you and your visitors unearth relationships that you didn't know existed amongst your data. And then finally, while Google was probably one of the first kids on the block, it's certainly no longer the only player in this solution space. I love this slide um, to, to show as an example of um, the navigational aspect of maps. Um, I like to do quite a few uh, live um, sites, but this one tends to be down quite a bit, which is unfortunate because it really illustrates very nicely what I'm talking about. So this is like a, a news feed. The news articles are on the right, and you can select a country the normal way by using the uh, menu bar at the, at the top where it says world, and you can go into Asia, and then you go Far East, and you go Afghanistan, and you go, oh, no news. Okay, try again. Uh, world, Asia, Far East, Syria. No, no news. Why not use the map? The map has uh, an, all the hotspots on it. Those colored circles show the number of articles that are uh, developing uh, today, in the last 24 hours, I think, and they will appear on the right. But then also, when you click on the right, the map will update and zoom in on where that article takes place. So it's a, it's a shame that this site isn't uh, up more, because uh, it really is, illustrates the power of map as a navigation tool very well. In terms of making, uh, giving your sites a different look and feel, other than the sort of standard Google look. There's a lovely site called uh, Snazzy Maps. Um, and what that is, making this a bit bigger for you. So this, this, this one is a, is a standard uh, Google look, right? Except that uh, Google tends to use the red markers, and in this case, the blue. Um, but that's your, your standard. Uh, now kind of boring Drupal, uh, sorry, uh, Google look and feel. What the guys at Snazzy Maps have done is that they've collected uh, contributions from, um, from lots of people who have done beautiful things with maps, all sorts of different canvases that you can use. There's, there's literally hundreds for them. So if you like one, you click on one, find a, a copy button here, click on that, copy to clipboard, and to then use that on your site, you go to your view, because most maps in Drupal are driven by views. Go to the settings se section. Find this little spot here. Paste that in. Apply. And then hopefully, when I save, suddenly I've given my map a completely different look. It's still the same Google map with the same amount of detail, but someone has been arty with it to fit your, the theme of your site. 
So it's a nice and quick way to, um, to give your maps a whole different look. So I've just introduced the first uh, map module. Um, it's called IP Geoloc Geolocation Views and Maps. Um, and it's certainly not the only one. As you can see here, maps in Drupal is a bit of a jungle. Basically, there's three silos. The silo on the far left is the silo of modules that offer ways to store your latitude and longitude. You've got to have latitude and longitude to put a location on the map. The silo on the right are uh, the three main map renderers that we have. Everyone knows about Google, but there's also open layers. And most recently, uh, Leaflet came on the market, which is a, a package that concentrates on mobile and being uh, very light and nimble. Then in the, mim in the middle, there's a section that usually involves um, views and an, an additional module that massages the results from views to make them suitable for maps. So those modules do stuff like color code your markers based on maybe a content type or a taxonomy term. Um, they prepare the, marker, the contents for the marker balloon. If you click on a marker, you can often see a photograph of, a, of whatever that marker represents, some text, some links, etc. And so your task is to pick a module on the left, one in the middle, and one on the right to make it all work. Problem is, you can't pick just any module from the left, but any module of the middle and any module of the right. Um, there's more documentation on Drupal.org, but it's, it took me quite a while to reach this stage, and this, is, this hasn't got even everything in it, but, you know, ran out of space. So, if you ask me, Rick, I, I just want to get started at, at Maps, cut the crap, give me something that I can work with, then I re um, recommend this. So that module in the middle, middle there has the advantage that you can connect any of the modules on the left for co coordinate storage with any of the three um, rend map renderers. So you don't get locked in. It's, it, it may be a very good solution if you are asked to create maps for a site that is already locked in to one of the modules on the left, say, for storage, then you know you can accommodate that. You don't have to tell your client, you have to do, redo all your coordinate storage with this other module because I want to do maps this way and that map module requires you change the latitude and longitude storage. So in summary, that's, this is my sort of uh, easy map starter kit. Um, I would pick Geofield for the latitude and longitude uh, also because it comes with a nice views plugin that allows you to do proximities, which is always cool. Um, then uh, views because, well, you can't avoid it. IP, geolocation, views, and maps. And then of the three, I have a slight preference for leaflet, but open layers is good. Uh, Google is also good. They all deliver slightly different things maybe. But um, anyway, you can, you can pick and mix with this, with this setup. Um, leaflet more maps is a module very much like, like SNESI maps in that it allows you to, change, to uh, pick different canvases. Um, so you can give your maps a completely different look by going to a different provider, go Esri, go Google, uh, go Stamen. There's, there's, there's a dozen map box. There's a dozen providers out there that you can all pick from. Uh, they are leaflet more maps basically provides you a drop down of about 20 or so and uh, You can change that for every map so you can have 20 different styles on you on the one side uh, Yeah, so I'm so I'm so bad with, with memory So I have to put my uh, reminder messages for myself in, into the slides uh, So yeah, we're, we're now going to show you a bit of uh, the clustering um, Which hopefully up here. Yay. So, just in case you have been living under a rock and wonder, well, this clustering stuff, why, why would I need that? There's your answer. Um, it looks kind of uh, funky, but say uh, I, I'm interested in the Chicago area. Uh, okay, is that here? No, that's Michigan. Uh, no. Okay, so well, I can log. Uh, I can zoom in, of course. 
and then I can pan a bit and then uh, maybe zoom in a bit more. Look, it's, it's laborious, right? This is a mess. I just told you that maps are great navigational tools, but you need something more to uh, deal with this. And so people have realized this years ago and have um, created plugins, often in JavaScript, um, to deal with lots of markers. And they're, they're called clustering algorithms. There's, there's ones for Google. This one is uh, for Leaflet. It's called Leaflet Marker Cluster. And it's a, it's a beautiful uh, piece of work because it clusters those, uh, those markers into centers. Um, and when you click on a center, it zooms in and explodes into other cent smaller centers. And now I can actually easily navigate to Chicago or any area I need there. It all works beautiful. However, there is still a bit of an issue. Didn't want to do that. When you hover over a cluster, you get the outline of the population. That's useful information. If it was kind of uh, accurate. First of all, um, the outline is completely arbitrary. This clustering algorithm is based on pixel distance, and so it includes or excludes markers from a cluster at random, at purely by distance. So you get a cluster outline that cuts straight through the middle of Texas, uh, Arkansas, Alabama, blah de blah and also cuts through the sea suggesting that there was something happening in the sea. And we have seen the previous page. Uh, if, if this is a population of seagulls, then maybe it could be correct. But we saw the previous slide with all the mar markers. There were no markers in the sea, right? So for this outline to suggest that there's markers in the sea is a, is a bit, yeah, not, not great. Plus, it's a completely arbitrary outline, yeah? It's, it's because the outline is based, uh, is created using an algorithm called the convex hull. And a convex hull is a fantastic mathematical solution, but not for this problem. So recently, another plugin came out that builds on that and that makes, adds region awareness to all those clus the clusters. And now, every cluster that you see here is with respect to a state. So now we're talking about really meaningful data, right? So when it says here 237, I can be sure that it's 237 in Texas. Not some in Texas, some in Alabama, and some in Mexico. Also, the, the outline is, is much tighter, so it more accurately reflects the real extent of the population. And of course, when you, when you dig in, because the regions that it knows about form a hierarchy, so we go from country to state to suburb, that's reflected in, in those clusters. So going down to San Antonio, it's still talking at that point about uh, Texas, but going down further, it now says you're in San Antonio and these are the suburbs or postcodes of those suburbs, right? So, That's region-aware clustering. And the great news is that you can do that yourself. It's not hard. You don't need code. And I'm going to show you some examples of Drupal sites um, that use this sort of um, technology. Uh, hold on. So hopefully this one works. So this site uh, is uh, done by a Spanish company uh, for a European city project. It's a project that uh, displays uh, smart cities. So they've got a number of uh, programs that these cities can be involved with. On the left-hand side, you see them color-coded. So there's three types of markers, uh, yellow, green, and orange. Um, and they've used clustering here as well. So in this, in this case, the regions are uh, countries. And then under the countries, there's probably a sublevel. Um, so that one is the Netherlands, Germany. The thing to note here in particular is that 
thanks to the region awareness, these little countries like the Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg have a voice. If there was no region awareness, then those little countries, although they've got a significant population in terms of markets, they would be completely clobbered by their neighbours. They would swallow them up and you would not even know that there's something hap interesting happening in the Netherlands, Belgium, those smaller countries. So it's a very, very useful application of the clustering. Uh, what they've done here as well, that's not part of the standard Drupal set. Um, they make uh, further filtering through some custom JavaScript, so um, I can drill into the commitments and the, the map updates accordingly as well. So it's, it's quite, quite a nice site to check out. The next one um, I really love because of the colors, but also because this developer realized that regions don't have to be on land, right? Uh, nice one. Uh, they can be in the sea, right? The concept of region is completely abstract. A region is what you call, what you want it to be. It doesn't have to be administrative areas. So, I think we are having a little issue with the internet. <laughs> okay, it, the, the, the tars don't come up. Um, but basically, uh, it's the same concept, except it's in the sea, right? So you have your clusters, you hover over them, you go to the next level in the hierarchy. We're now at the mid-Atlantic range, dig a bit deeper, and we get the sub-regions of the Atlantic range and so forth. So, yeah, sorry that, oh, finally, finally we're coming in. So you, as you zoom out, you see the cluster, clusters form, and we're back. The last one um, is a tourism site in South Africa. And this site makes use of uh, geolocation that you have available on your mobile phone. So every mobile phone these days is equipped with both Wi-Fi and GPS to accurately um, identify you. And you can do that uh, uh, here by clicking the Find Me button. But of course, it would put us in Australia. And this site is about South Africa, so we won't see much. So as an alternative, uh, you can type in a location here that you want to go to um, and hit go. And it will place that red position marker, which is kind of you visiting that area on the map and shows you all the places where you can sleep, eat, drink and explore around it. Uh, and this one also features the, um, the region aware clustering, so it shows you Muscle Bay and the individual suburbs, etc. Click on a marker, you get a photograph and a link to more details of that particular place. Okay. So we've gone through clustering, we've gone through region aware clustering. Now that we've got our markers into, um, grouped into meaningful areas, can we now do something with that? Like apply key performance indicators relevant to, to the site. An example is uh, real estate prices. If you're like me and you came to Melbourne 20 years ago uh, and you decide to, that you want to stay, you're interested in uh, renting or buying, where are the affordable suburbs? Why, where are the suburbs that are close to the beach? Uh, how far do I have to move away from my ideal area before prices become affordable? Uh, it would be great if, that all, if all of that was put on a map. Um, through, with, with, with a map showing for each suburb what the average um, house price is. So I've created a demo around that, um, except that I'm not using real estate prices, I'm using something, something much more important in Melbourne, and that's the price of coffee. <laughs> so, um, there's me on my uh, bicycle, 
maybe one day it will be a Ferrari, but for, for now a trusty, rusty old bike will do. So um, this site also has, uses that um, GPS locator that is on every phone and available through this module. So it's event identified me as at 51 Clarendon Street, South Bank, which is where we are now. And already um, I can see one coffee shop in the area. And the coffee there is $4.50, which is pretty expensive. And that's why it's colored red. So all the markers are color coded by, by uh, price range. Yeah? So I may have to hop on my bike and go a bit further, zoom out a bit, and see if there's cheaper coffees around. Um, and there are, so there's a green one popping up all the way on the right there. I mean, that's, I think that's uh, Ikea, $2.50 for a bottomless coffee. I mean, who can compete with that? Um, and here in the center, there's a cluster in the CBD, and it has, so we've got two numbers now. The, the top number is the count, as before. So that's the number of coffee shops in, in that outline. Um, but the second number is the price, the average price of the coffee shops in that in that area, and it's $4.50, still quite expensive, so that's why it's in red. As I zoom out further, maybe I should make this a bit bigger, a bit more attractive, um, the clusters start to, to form, but remember, they are region bound, they are region aware, so now we get some interesting pictures, because the regions that I clo uh, chose here, they could be suburbs, right, they could be postcodes, but I've gone for something else, I've just simply gone for north, south, east, west, because, as I said, regions are abstract, a region is whatever you want it to be. So if I now look here, this is the area north, and uh, it's yellow, so it's not the cheapest coffee, but still good value at $3.64. Uh, cheaper at the east and in the center, pretty expensive in the, in the center, in CBD, and go, don't go south for a coffee, it's hot pink, really expensive, but great Drupal conferences. Uh, <laughs> There comes a point, if I, as I zoom out further, that it doesn't make sense any longer to hold on to the regions at this level. You want to move to the city level at some point, right? Because as I'm zooming out, we're getting this bird's eye view of Australia. And so this is where it lets go of the regions at that level because it's not appropriate anymore. We're now talking cities. But the aggregation still works. So it's hard to see, but it actually says 31, so the population of coffee shops surveyed is 31, and the number below it is 379. So that's the average of price of coffee in, in Melbourne. All right? But think, think of this, this is just coffee shops, but think you're um, a manager of um, McDonald's Victoria, right? And you've got all these, um, this information um, about your uh, franchises like this, like a boring table. Uh, very hard to make sense of. And, but, you, but you put them on a map. And so you see here, let's say, the average turnover of McDonald's shops, right? And I click on that now as a manager, and I can say, hey, here, these guys here, they've got really high turnover. What, what's, what's happening there? It could, is, is it the weather? Is it the location? Or oh, this one, of these three, this one is the best. Why is that McDonald's so doing so well? Maybe I should call up the manager and find out what his secret is. So the maps really help you find information that you didn't know existed. And, and then after you've spoken to that manager, he may give you some ideas that will work for all, most of your branches. And so you improve your business just by, looking, by using maps as a way to elicit um, data. Okay, yes, how are we going for time? Because, sorry? Well, that's a, left or? Left. Oh, that's a lot, okay. Um, I, I thought that might be the case, so um, I, I prepared one more thing that has to do not directly with maps, but it does have to do with visualization and, and, and um, making apparent relationships in your data that are not immediately clear from um, a table like this. And so to get to that, I need to tell you a little uh, bit of background. Um, there are many charting packages already in Drupal, and so uh, me and two de uh, fellow developers really hesitated introducing a new one. But the fact was that for our problem, 
none of the existing solutions worked. And the, exist the, the, the use case was this. With views, you can create lots of plugins that, modif that present your views data in different kind of ways. In fact, you see two here right on the screen. One is a table and the other is the map. You can also um, create, let's say, uh, sort of a post processor. And there's a module called Views Aggregator Plus that does that. It basically does spreadsheety spread <laughs> things. Um, that's a terrible word. Um, like, Stuff, stuff that you can't do on the database. So that's why you let do, views do its thing, and then the results come back. You put it through this post processor, and it processes stuff. And then you want to plot that. But now we're hitting an, an architectural limit with views, because you can have only one plugin at a time. right? So you can have the table or, or the map, but you can't go sort of through the table or, or through a post processor and then chart that. And this, this was the problem, and that's why we had to find a solution. And we found a solution. And then when we had that solution, then we really realized that it's actually quite a generic solution. In fact, the solution we came up with works on any table on your screen, on your site. So you find, find a table on your site, and it could be a web form, and it could be views output, or it could be a table created by a content editor using a WYSIWYG. It doesn't matter. And when you find the table, oh, look, here's one. You hover over it, and you get this cogwheel, and it says, insert chart from table. And you click on that. And there's your table. Couldn't be more easy. So what it's done here is um, it's taken the first column as the horizontal axis, so that's all our suburbs. And it found out that the second and third column is just uh, text, so can't be plotted. And then it plots the third and the final column, which uh, contain the coffee price and the distance. And because this table is uh, uh, sorted by distance, you see the red bars go up and uh, the coffee price goes up and down because of the, it's in different suburbs. So I guess our task is to find a coffee shop that is one, has a short red bar because it's cheap, uh, sorry, because it's close, and then also a short blue bar because it's cheap. So uh, maybe around there is a good, a good point. Um, of course, now that we've got a table, we don't have to stick with that. You can configure the chart and say, I don't want columns. I want a smooth interpreted line. I don't like those colors. I want olive and I want orange and, uh, okay, maybe you want it a bit bigger as well. So, and we had say, So there you go. So here we have on the, on the one, one screen basically three ways to look at the data as a boring table, as a chart that allows you to see trends, very useful, and then as a map that allows you to see um, through its color coding, the geographic um, dispersion, um, allows you to see lots of, lots of further relationships, especially with that aggregation on it as well and the, and the, the color codes. Um, I think I'm very close to the end of my presentation. Um, I hope you feel inspired. I, uh, I thank the organizers for having me and, um, and doing my story. Um, as you uh, travel back, um, please, please be aware that um, that, that, you, that, you can try, that you can try this at home for sure. Um, it, it requires no coding. Drop your tables, raise your maps. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Address fields, um, yep. Now, generally, um, there's either Google that does the validation of the address, but um, have you ever used like a previous host API to do address validation? And so, have you seen any? No, I've, I've used um, uh, in Drupal, I, I, I do use address field, and you can combine that with a, a module called Geocoder, which will take the, the address as filled out 
um, to an external service like Google, like you said, um, and then Google comes back with uh, the latitude and longitude. And uh, most of the times, that for me, that has worked fine, and it's free service. Um, yeah, so I haven't used Australia Post myself. Anyone here that did use Australia Post that can help this gentleman? I've been too busy uh, doing that. Uh, but this gentleman here may know something about that. <laughs> Want to speak up, Peter? Um, sorry. <laughs> Is this a question? Can you do the same functionality in Canadian layers? Um, I, I say yes. I, last fall, I, I started doing some leaf lab stuff, but surrendered. <laughs> so I joined uh, Drupal in creating the next version for the open layers integration. And as of last Saturday, there's a CF beta OpenLayers3x, which bases on the latest uh, JavaScript library, and also on absolutely, absolutely rewritten uh, code base, which is... But that's the 3D version, right? The, the, the 3x version. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I didn't pick up the slide down. But what I'm trying to do is like staying open layers too, but do the clustering properly and the linking system and stuff. Well, I, I'm also working with, with Cloud, and that's the all on geo clusters, but there is just a few projects, so I'm not quite sure if it's feasible at the moment. Okay, because we've got open layers too, but uh, okay. Well, at the back, James. Yeah, I should should have researched it a bit better. I remember I got this question uh, two years ago in uh, in in Sydney when I did a similar talk, and somebody stood up and said because I have no idea, <laughs> somebody stood up and said the fact that you that you have the table at the bottom goes somewhat towards accessibility. Whether it's enough, I don't know. Could anyone in the room comment on that? Great, there's your answer. Uh, the, the, Thanks very much. The, the sidechain is the role of public line people and being in there. So. Okay. Aren't there uh, lots of forms of colour blindness though, not just red green? I didn't say I had the answer, but I. <laughs> 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 and, and, and there's some in the industry struggling with, I think, that comment. I have part of an answer for the colour blindness issue. Yep. Um, you can, with, uh, I don't know whether you can do it with Drupal, but I know with Leaflet you can change the, um, the things that get dropped. I designed a site for GovHack last year where we, we use different colored pins and also different shapes of, of pins with different numbers on them. So you can tell without looking at the color at all what kind of pin is where. Um, so I know that Leaflet has the ability to go and change all that stuff, but I'm not sure how, how well it is approached in, in Drupal. Uh, that's all sort of taken from that. Right? That's all solely the more track and solely based on that as well. Yes, which is also extra cool. Uh, no, not yet. Um, I, I guess I have to face up to the music at some point, but um, I, I haven't spent a lot of time on um, converting all of this to uh, API. Um, yep. I don't know of any movement of consolidating the storage. Um, Methods. I have seen um, attempts to consolidate uh, map modules, so um, and those attempts seem to have stalled. I, th I think the problem is that while maps have a lot of commonality, uh, there's every every provider also brings something special, and so when you try to generalize that, then you end, sort of end up with a a lowest common denominator that doesn't have any of the bells and whistles that each <laughs> the individual ones have. So, um, yeah. I'll answer that for you again. Um, there's, there's, there's a word like 
then it all goes into a decline. Mm-hmm. Which is why it's publicly announced that there's all these declines and people are selected out of the maze. And they're basically just the irrigation formula. I guess there's very small amounts of oil through the decline. You have to understand production and then you put mass generation and mass publishing as two very different exercises. If you can do that in politics and way, you can then basically prevent any cost, any mass from anywhere on top of any other mass from anywhere, providing you understand I, I can. Uh, yeah. Yes, and you can already do that. So what, what you talk about is, is is right, but it's sort of at the what, what I would call in that in that slide sort of at the the renderer level, and and that's for them to sort out. Yes, but at the Drupal level, in terms of the modules, that's what I was talking about in particular. Whether that because we've got so many modules, right? So why, and and that has not so much to do with what you talk about. That's sort of the 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 back end of it. That's more about, yeah, lots of individuals, lots of developers, all doing their own, oops, yeah, own, own thing. The um, distribution of Drupal called the Taro, yep. which actually puts the back end and the front end in the Drupal environment. It's mm -hmm. basic and that's not true. But if we, if we run, we went away from it, then we said we need to run the existing environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, rewrote a, uh, a JavaScript plug plugin that takes that uh, the, 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 the sort of the standard clustering plugin to the next level uh, by an, uh, adding the region awareness. Uh, so it's a, it's a pure JavaScript thing. It has nothing to do with Drupal by itself. Um, but of course, like so many other JavaScript plugins, people write modules to uh, incorporate that JavaScript, and that's that's what we've done. So how do you define the regions? Okay, so the regions, uh, that's an interesting question. That sort of goes to the heart of the, of the uh, algorithm. Um, some people think like, okay, in order to, to tell whether a marker is within a region, I have to find the, the border of the region, right? So I need to have like a polygon of the region and then I have to do a point and polygon to find out whether that marker, no, it's much simpler than that. The only, the, 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 only information needed for inclusion within a region is a label on the marker that says, I am in north, right? And that's how inclusion is handled. You don't need to know the borders of the countries and the states and the cities and the, uh, the streets and blah, 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 in order to find out whether a marker is in, in a particular street, suburb, blah, blah, and so forth. All you need to know, all the marker needs to to expose, basically, is to say, I am in South Bank, which is in Melbourne, which is in Victoria, which is in um, Australia. So those, th there you've got a region hier hierarchy of four, but it doesn't have to be four, you can have just two. Like with, with my coffee shops, I had North East South West, and then I had Greater Melbourne, and that was it. Uh, could have gone all the way up to the, to the top of the Australia if I wanted, which was done for some of the other maps. Okay, so uh, depends a bit, but experimental evidence says that because of the the animation and sorry, because of the the clustering is done on the on the the JavaScript side, um, and you need to push all that information to to the client side. That about five thousand uh, markers after that, it sort of starts to break down. And the way to to counteract that is to use uh, filtering in your views query, uh, in particular, of course, uh, distance. So you find that the uh, database query is not the thing that takes all the time. It's, it's pretty uh, efficient to say, give me all the markers within 100 kilometers. And that way you can reduce your set, which was maybe 50,000, to just a few thousand that are within a range of 100 kilometers. And then it works well. All done. Thank you.